Bible to the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as recorded by the beloved physician, Dr. Luke, Luke chapter 9. The gospel of our Lord and Savior is recorded by the New Testament writer, St. Luke, Luke chapter 9, and I want to look this morning at verses 28 through 26 as we will conclude message that we started on last week, Luke chapter 9, verses 28 through 36. And it came to pass about an eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glistering. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, or Elijah, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and they that were with him were heavy and would sleep, and when they awake, they saw his glory, and the two men that stood with him. And it came to pass, as they departed from him, Peter said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. And while he thus spake, there came a cloud and overshadowed them, and they feared as they entered into the cloud. And there came a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. And when the voice was passed, Jesus was found alone. And they kept it close and told no man in those days any of those things which they had seen. May the Lord rich blessing be to the reading of his word. May it be sanctified in the hearts and minds of God's people. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word, for the interest of your word gives light. And now we pray that you might speak to us, that we might behold glorious, magnificent, and splendid truth from your law to the end, that we might be encouraged, that we might be strengthened, and that we might indeed be fortified to do your will. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. You may be seated. I would like to conclude the message that we began on last week that we entitled simply that God admits that he the baby daddy, that God admits that he the baby daddy. We said that was important because it's always important for a father to admit and accept paternity. Because when a father admits and accepts paternity, it means that he is accepting the financial responsibility associated with caring for the child. But he's also accepting the responsibility for the child's development, the child's growth, the child's nurture, the child's maturity. And he's accepting responsibility to bring the child to full-fledged manhood or womanhood so that that child can then discharge the giftedness uh, that is resident inside of them that God has placed there. And so we begin last week just by way of review, and we look first at Luke chapter 2, and you might want to turn there, uh, verses 42 through 52. And this is an important passage of Scripture because uh, other than the birth of Christ and the wise men's visits to Christ, uh, this is the only mention of Jesus' childhood. And we said this was probably the time of his bar mitzvah. Uh, he had been taken to Jerusalem by his parents, for the Passover feast, and at which time his bar mitzvah had taken place, and now uh, there had been bestowed upon him privileges of a young man, and also there would be expected from him certain responsibilities that young manhood would afford one. And so the family is now returning back, and in their caravan, they are separated by some distance, and then the mother realizes that the child is not with other relatives as she had thought, and so there's some anxiety, and so they retrace their steps, and they go back to Jerusalem, and they arrive at Jerusalem, they find Jesus in the temple, dialoguing with, debating, 
entertain and responding to questions from the religious, spiritual, and political leadership of that day. In verse 47 of Luke chapter 2, the text in essence says that the doctors of the law, the Pharisees, the Sadducees very possibly, they were astonished at his wisdom. They were astonished at his spiritual insight. They were astonished at his maturity. They were astonished. And we said that some of the children in our church astonish us with their wisdom, astonish us with their maturity, even at their young and tender age. When his parents arrived, the text says they were amazed. The doctors were astonished and the parents were amazed that their boy had such wisdom. That their boy had such maturity, that he had such an intellect that he could basically weigh in on the weighty discussions of the day. Oh, I wish that God would give me some young folk who really wanted to be great. Who really wanted to be great and who really wanted to put in the time to really to understand the issues of the day and to prepare themselves to be the thought leaders in the society. I try to get young people to understand it's a misnomer that money rules the world. The money ranks pretty high up there in terms of importance, don't get me wrong, and make as much as you possibly can legally. Because you need to finance your dreams. You need to finance your passion. There's no doubt about it in the capitalistic free enterprise economy. But the people with the ideas are the people who really rule the world. And they can persuade other people to act on their ideas. It's so what we see today, and the reason our culture is in decline is because the real thought leaders are not being heard today. It's those who have access and control of the media, the print page, the airwaves, both TV and radio, and their thinking is so shallow. And so the real thought leaders are being muzzled and they are not being heard, but a few people who control certain means of communication are controlling the dialogue and the conversation. And so what is needed is a grassroots resurgence and an emergence of the grassroots level of thought leaders, people who understand the times, know what's going on, who's able to articulate and respond to issues to help people understand what really is taking place. I would encourage all you young people to, to follow the news and follow what's taking place in Iraq. I talked to you about that on last week. Because you're going to pay for this. Because we're going to be there for a long period of time. Follow this, what's taking place with the tsunamis in the Pacific Rim. Because you're going to pay for this because we've kind of got help to finance these nations. We need these nations to be strong because these nations are part of our market and they're products that we send to these people as consumers of products that we make here and they're products that they make there. We can't just leave those people over there and their economy a decimate. You see, people don't understand that. It's not true altruism. We're not doing it just because we're concerned about those people and we are concerned about those people. But we're doing what we're doing because we have an economic and a political vested interest. Because we don't live on an island in the United States of America by ourselves. We manufacture more goods than what we can consume. And we need markets to sell our stuff to. And most of the people in the world are in Asia, not in the United States of America. So you young people need to understand that, that what takes place in these other nations have a tremendous impact on what's going to happen to you in terms of your taxes, in terms of how much your money is going to go to foreign countries, whether it's rebuilding Afghanistan, rebuilding Iraq, rebuilding the countries in the Pacific Rim. These are issues that's going to affect you for a long period of time. And while we be bopping and shaking it fast and listening to all this nonsense, we're not really educating ourselves on what's taking place in the world and the impact that's going to have on us. And that's why his parents were amazed. They were amazed because they were amazed at the fact that he knew exactly what the political, social, economic issues were of the day, and he was able to articulate those issues to the thought leaders that existed in their society. And they were amazed at that because they hadn't taught him. They hadn't taught him that stuff, and he knew things that they hadn't taught him, so they were amazed. And so his mother says to him, boy, don't you know your daddy and I were concerned about you? You've caused us anxiety, frustration, and fear. Don't you know that? Now, Jesus, for the first time to them, said, no, wait a minute, mother, I love you dearly. I respect you, but it's my responsibility to be about my father's business. And so the first time Jesus identifies and acknowledges that he knows that Joseph is not really his father. That he's been a good surrogate, he's been a good stepfather, but Joseph is not really his father. And that his 
real father is God, and he must be about his father's business. Oh, I wish I had some young people that really want to be great, and I would give the best years of my life left to pour into them all that I've been able to learn and understand about what's really taking place inside the church and outside the church to, to equip them to be world-class leaders in the 21st century because that is what we so desperately need. People whose minds have been transformed by the Word of God, who are controlled by the Spirit of God, but who also are intellectuals and they understand what issues are and they understand you cannot solve a spiritual problem with a social solution. And that's the great dilemma. We're trying to solve great, complex spiritual problems, whether it's violence in the community, whether it's substance abuse in the community, whether it's domestic violence in the community. The reason there's violence, substance abuse, the reason there's domestic violence is because there's something wrong in people's hearts and something wrong in people's heads. And only the Spirit of God can transform people's hearts and change what's inside of people's heads. And yes, there are social things you have to do, job training programs, education programs, economic development programs. Yes, you have to do those things. But you do those things in the context of understanding you're dealing with a spiritual dilemma. And you're trying to bring to bear a spiritual solution while you deal with the social manifestations, which are nothing more than the symptoms of a deeper-rooted problem. The doctors were astonished. The parents were amazed. And the boy just answered, I got to be about my father's business. And at some point in time, young people got to come to realize, you better get about God's business. And, and, I, and we as parents, we haven't set very good examples for you about prioritizing what really is important. Because you've not seen us read the word of God. You've not seen us pray. You've not seen us invest in our spiritual lives. You don't see ourselves in, inconveniencing ourselves to grow spiritually. And we only serve God when it accommodates our schedule and our agenda. And so you don't think it's that important because we haven't showed you it's very important. But whether we've showed you or not, you've got to deal with the realities of what you've got to deal with. And what I'm suggesting to you is time for you as young people to understand, I got to be about my father's business. I got to find out what it is God wants me to do. And the sooner you find that out, the better off you'll be because the less time you'll waste with a bunch of nonsense. Find the will of God early in your life and stay in the will of God all your life and you'll save yourself from some horror and some pain and some disappointment and some heartache. Some heartache. Jesus was always about the father's business. That was his answer. Now he's set his course, and his course is to be about the father's business as he identifies that he knows who his father really is. Well, the next scene we look at is in Luke chapter 3, and we refer to this text often because it's an important text. It is the baptism of Jesus. Baptism is important. Water baptism is important. It does not save you, nor does it add to your salvation, but water baptism is important because it symbolizes your identification with Jesus Christ in his death and in his burial and in his resurrection. And so if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, but you've never been baptized in water, then you have never, of your own will and choice, truly, fully identified with Christ publicly in his death, burial, and resurrection. So baptism symbolizes physically and visibly what has taken place invisibly, mysteriously, and spiritually, that when you accepted Christ, God the Holy Spirit then took you and he immersed you in Jesus Christ. He identifies you with Jesus Christ. He identifies you with the body of Christ. He identifies you with the death of Christ, burial of Christ, and resurrection of Christ. But watch this. In John's baptism, all these sinners were coming out to be baptized of John because John was warning him, you better flee from the wrath that's going to come. John said, judgment is going to come. God is getting ready to lay the ax to the root of the tree, and God is getting ready to judge, and you've got to get right with God. And the people understood that if judgment was pending, that the only way to avoid judgment was repentance. But the United States of America still has not figured that out. Since 9-11-01, church attendance is down, giving is down, evangelism is down, worship is down, everything is down when you look at the spiritual indicators. Since we were devastated, in 2001 because we still haven't got it we still have not got it and that's why I'm trying to get the church to understand we better look what's taking place in a specific realm because sometimes you can't see stuff when it's up real close to you but when it's at a distance you get a panorama and you can see it and we better take our telescopes and we better look to the specific realm to see the type of devastation that could take place in this country now, I don't care how many sensors they put out in the Pacific Ocean. 
to pick up the tsunami waves. You see, the problem in India, when the tectonic plates came together and the earth was displaced between the ocean floor to create the tidal wave moving at 500 miles per hour across the Indian Ocean with no warning, and because those are basically poor nations in that particular area, they could not afford the sophisticated technology to put the sensors out in the water so they could sense that the tsunami was coming so they could warn the people to evacuate. But we got a whole lot of money, so we got our sensors out in the Pacific. Because there is a real possibility that there could be an earthquake, 9, 9, 4, two on the Richter scale that would take place, rock California, create a tsunami out there in the Pacific somewhere, and it would move in the shore. But we think we got it figured out. We're going to pick it up, and we're going to evacuate the people before it gets there. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to Los Angeles or not, at, at rush hour. <laughs> but you don't go nowhere in a hurry in Los Angeles at rush hour. I don't care how much advance warning that you got. And here in the United States of America, we are basically on either side of us, the Pacific on one side and the Atlantic on the other side. This whole country could be covered by water. And I started sharing with the church the other night, other Wednesday night, you know, I tell you what, when that thing hit, the only thing I could think about was the old Negro spiritual. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. You better get ready and bear this in mind. God showed Noah the rainbow sign. It won't be water but fire next time. If that type of devastation can come just from one earthquake. But God said judgment won't be by water next time. But fire, imagine what the judgment is going to be like when the fire is raining down out of heaven and there will be no place to hide. And the only way to avoid the pending judgment is repentance. So John is preaching the baptism of repentance. And Jesus comes to John because Jesus understands the significance of baptism. He understands its symbolism. And so he submits to it, not that he needed to repent, but Jesus is identifying with sinners. He identifies with sinners in water baptism. He comes to John, and John says, Lord, I should be baptized of you, and you coming to me. And Jesus says, allow it to be so, John, to fulfill all righteousness. Because I'm about doing the Father's business, not about whether people think I'm a sinner or not. Are y'all following me? Let me tell you something that's funny. When we had the watch night service, and so my daughter is doing some work downtown at one of the hotels, and so... She's doing this catering thing, so every now and then her schedule's way off, so I got to make sure she got her way home. And so I went down there to see what time she was going to get out, and so I stepped up in the hotel, and they got parties on, people coming out in zoot suits, big gangster hats, all that type of stuff. <laughs> I, I really thought it was a costume party. I didn't know those people really were dressed like that, for real. I slayed at the front desk. I said to ma'am, I'm looking for my daughter, Bethany Watts. She's doing one of these catering deals here. I'm not sure which room she in. Normally, I have to go to the whole hotel trying to find her. So I figured, maybe somebody knows where she is. Late, so I think she's right across the hall. So I stepped up in the room. My goodness, the, 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 the alcohol just like almost knocked me to my knees. I stepped up in the room. They're trying to give me a band and wristband. Now, I don't need no wristband. I'm just looking for my daughter to give her my car key so she can get home. So I stepped up in there and caught it. Uh, I contact with a couple of people. They said, Reverend Watts, what are you doing up in here? <laughs> and I said, I'm looking for my daughter. But the $64 million dollar question, what are you doing up in here? <laughs> oh, it was funny. The brother Tony Gordon and I, we sat out there and we chuckled. He had to pick up one of his nephews. It was funny, man. It was funny. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, man, I've been to church. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know, I didn't know people still dressed up in zoot suits the big old gangster hats and started to turn them. I, I thought that stuff was out of vogue. It went out with, with afros and bell bottom pants and plaids and business and, and raccoon coats. Man, people make you laugh, man. Life is just funny. What are you doing up in here? So if somebody said the Reverend Watts was at the party, don't believe it. I'm down there trying to get my daughter home. I just been at church. I got here to church at 5 o'clock. Service didn't start till like 8. And I didn't leave until the last person left. But what are you doing up in here? Well, Jesus wasn't too concerned about them saying, well, man, what are you doing with the sinners? He's going to get baptized. The sinners getting baptized. He must be a sinner. He must really be born out of wedlock. He must, something must be wrong with him. He wasn't concerned about that because his will was to do the will of God. And to do the will of God, he has to identify with the publicans and the sinners. And so the Bible says because he was totally submitted to the will of God that he goes and Jesus is baptized. Now watch the text in Luke 3, 21. The text says, 
Now, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying. Jesus was baptized and praying, and then the Bible says, and the heaven opened to him. See, when you totally submit yourself to the will of God, the heavens open up. The heavens opened up, and the heavens opening up symbolizes access to God. The heavens have been shut up like brass for 700 years. There had been no prophetic word from God. There's no recorded word from God from Malachi to Matthew because the heavens were closed. And then God sends this madman dressed with a leather girdle about his loins, eating wild uh, honey and, 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 and locusts, preaching repentance. And that was the first clear word that the people had heard, had from God for a long time. But now Jesus shows up and the Bible says the heavens open. The heavens open. And there he's standing, there in the chilly waters of the Jordan, and the heavens opens up, the Bible says, and the text goes on to say, and the Spirit descends. God will open the heavens, and God will send down his Spirit, his anointing, his supernatural power to equip you to do what it is he's called you to do. So the heavens open. The Spirit descends. And then a voice speaks. Listen to what the voice says. Verse 22, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape, like a dove upon him, and a voice from heaven which says, Thou art my beloved Son, and thee I am well pleased. So God breaks his silence of 33 years. God breaks his silence probably about 30 years, because Jesus is about 30 years old at this time. So for 30 years, the question has been, who the baby daddy? Joseph, the best surrogate and the best stepfather he could be. Now God stands up and says, this is my beloved son. You are my son, and in you I'm well pleased. Now even Jesus in his humanity needed the affirmation. He needed the approval of his father and the support of his father. Some of y'all are looking for the support and approval of your father. You're denying it because you don't think you can ever get it. Maybe your father's dead. Maybe your father's not saved. Maybe your father abused you. But deep down inside of you, you're yearning for it. You're looking for it. You're longing for it. And that's one of the obstacles between you and your relationship with God is because when you think of your father, it's hard to think of it in a positive way. But I just stopped by to tell you that just like Jesus did, just like God did for Jesus, he will stand up when you put your faith in Jesus Christ and God will say, you are my beloved son, you are my beloved daughter, and you are well pleased. And God will open the heavens for you, and the Spirit will come down, and God will lead and direct you to do great things for him. The Father's affirmation, the Father's approval, the Father's blessing is what we're all looking for. And for some of us, we'll never find it in our earthly father, but we can find it in our heavenly father. And we can find that approval from the men of God who stand in God's stead. The younger men and young women, the men of God stand in God's place for those young people to see that somebody cares what happens to you. When you young people, when Mr. Dye gets up in your grill because he cares what happens to you. When we see you acting crazy, and we say, wait a minute, you can't act like that. This is the church of the living God. You've got to learn discipline and structure and order and submission to authority because you're going to be under somebody's authority for the rest of your life. Either on a job or either in jail. Pick your punishment. But God brings people in to stand as surrogates to help you navigate your way through those tempestuous, troublesome waters. Well, let me hurry up and get through well, the next thing we see is Luke chapter 9, verse 28, which is the text I read. And Luke records this with some vivid detail, as does Matthew, as does Mark, the synoptic gospel. They all record this incident. And the Bible says that Jesus took them up to a high place, up to a mountain. And sometimes you've got to just steal away and you've got to go to a high place. He takes them to a mountain. And he takes them there for a purpose. He took them up there to pray. Verse 28, he went up there to pray. The place is the mountain. The purpose is prayer. But when he gets there, something happens. His, his persona changes. The Bible says that he is transformed. 
his transfiguration. And the transfiguration of Jesus was not because of something that happened on the outside, it because of what was on the inside. Because on the inside of him was deity. On the inside of him was God. And so there he's transformed, the Bible says, his countenance radiates the glory of God. Transformed. And that's why I say the problem that we're dealing with is a spiritual problem. It takes a transformation from the inside to change people from the inside, the way they think, the way they perceive themselves, the way they perceive other people, the way they perceive their potential and their destiny when they realize that God is on the inside of me and God can change me and God is going to help me. Then your whole outlook on life changes. You know as bad as things are out there now? If I didn't know the Lord, I have me an AK-47. That's right, it's rough out there. As bad as things are out there now, if I didn't know him, then I would be disillusioned. As I look at the situation and realize that people don't care who's supposed to care, people get shot down and killed, nobody really cares that much about it. Anybody can become disillusioned with the state of affairs that we have now, and that's when the people of God has got to stand up and say, no, no, somebody care, God care. And God cares through us. And God cares about what happens to you as an individual. And you as an individual can change. You might not be able to change all your friends and your gang and your crew, but you can change. If you would turn to the Lord and cry out to him, he changed. His persona changed. And when you steal a way to be with God and to call on God, the Holy Spirit would change you from the inside out. And other people will start to see the change, the transformation, the metaphor of morphosis. And then the Bible says there were some guests that showed up. This is interesting. Two guests showed up. This was no vision, y'all. They showed up. Because <clears throat> Moses is alive somewhere, and Elijah is alive somewhere. This is no vision. They showed up on this mountain. There's Moses, and there's Elijah. Why are they there? Why are they there? Moses and Elijah, the, those two individuals, they represent the entire Old Testament. Moses represents the law of God. The, 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 the Pentateuch is referred to as the law of Moses, the first five books of the Old Testament. He represents the law. God used Moses to bring his law to the people. Moses was the deliverer that God used to bring them up out of Egyptian bondage. He represents the entire Old Testament law. Who's Elijah? The most revered prophet in history. Elijah represents the prophet. He represents the prophets, all the prophets of the Old Testament. Elijah represents them. So they're standing on this mountain is the law. All of God's word is there. The law, the prophets, and Jesus, God incarnate. Jesus, the New Testament, is there. Now watch this. This just blew Peter away. And Peter said, man, this is awesome. We've never been in a Bible conference like this. We've never been to a conference like this. We got the whole law here. We got the prophets here. And we got the whole New Testament right here. We just need to stay right up here. So Peter makes a proposal. He says, Lord, let me just build three tabernacles and let's just stay up here. Let's leave them drug addicts and pimps and prostitutes. Let's leave them gangsters downtown. Let's us stay up here and we're going to keep studying the Bible. Let Moses expound on the law. Let Elijah stir us with his preaching. And then Jesus, you tell us those sweet stories that make us feel so good. And you tell us those parables and you break this thing down. And we just want to stay right up here. And that's the problem with the church. The church is so hung up on having church, it can't be the church. The church is so hung up on the mountain with the law and with the prophet and with the New Testament, the church never gets back down to the valley. So Peter, Peter said, and I would probably say the same thing, let's just stay up here. Peter got tired of them running for their lives. They'd be over here, they come on to push Jesus off the cliff. They're over here, they're threatening. Peter said, we ain't got to put up with that. The people crazy out there, they got swords and they got clubs, they got knives. They're crazy, and we're trying to help them, and they don't care nothing about us, and they just want to turn around and kill us too. Let's stay up here, me, my fault, shut the door, no more, and may they farewell. 
may they fare well down there in the valley. That was his proposal. Look at the response of God's proclamation. Look at what happened. Verse 34, and while Peter was saying this, while it was still coming out of his mouth, he, Lord, let's just stay up here. We ain't got to go back down there. We just stay up here, and we'll send back and get the other the apostles, and they can come up here, and we can all just stay up here. And while he was saying this, a cloud formed and began to overshadow them, and, there, and they were afraid, and they, as they entered the cloud, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one, my beloved. Listen to him. And then when the voice was silent, Moses was gone, and Elijah was gone. And what's that all about? When you got Jesus, you don't need Moses, because he's greater than Moses. When you got Jesus, you don't need Elijah, because he is the great prophet, the great priest, and the great king. And he's the prophet that will come, and it will be greater than Moses. So he eclipses Moses. He eclipses Elijah. When you got Jesus, you got everything that you need. God said, you listen to him. Listen to him. Well, I don't have the time to deal with this, but you go back. And he said, no, dog, we can't stay up here. And they went back down in the valley, and the first thing they ran into was a bunch of demons that nobody could do nothing with but Jesus. And he tells them that you got to learn how to deal with demons. You're going to serve me. That's what Jesus told them. He goes, I'm getting ready to get up out of here. Y'all better learn how to do this because the demons ain't leaving. When I leave, they're going to stay. And so you better learn how to deal with them and how to take control of them, how to have power over them. Well, let me, let me close. This is demonic, y'all. I, I wish you could spend a day with me. You talk to some of these kids. This is not natural. This is unnatural. This is supernatural, a cold callousness has covered the hearts and minds of many of these young folk and don't think nothing about taking a gun out and shooting somebody. And some of them with no remorse. That's not natural, y'all. This is supernatural. The evil one has taken control of these young people at such an early age and they get this constant bombardment of sex and violence and looseness and irresponsibility and rebellion against authority. No restraint, no control on the inside of them, acting on instinct, acting on impulse, and being overstimulated every single day by the music and by the movies and by the TV programs, and it's acting on impulse from their basic animal instinct. This is not natural. This is supernatural. It takes a supernatural in 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 intervention to deal with it. To deal with it. Well, to Jack Benny might The last text I want you to look at is Luke chapter 12. In Luke chapter 12, it's getting pretty rough for Jesus now. It's getting pretty rough. And he knows that his time is just about up. But these guys are getting more hostile toward him. And watch what the text says. wondering what's, what's going to happen uh, to him. Look at verse 28. And after dealing with their covetousness and their greed there in the book of Luke, he says, but as God so raised the grass in the field, which is alive to today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And Jesus is always admonishing them for having a little bit of faith. But back up just for a second. Back up, back up to Luke chapter 9. I'm sorry, that's where I really want to conclude. I'm not going to get to chapter 12 this morning. Luke chapter 9. And the text that uh, I read in your hearing in Luke 9, as we'll close, Look at verse 28. And so they, they're, 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 they're totally transformed. And after Jesus' transformation, you find that everything now gets more difficult for him as you read through the Gospel of Luke. 
everything gets harder now. There's more pressure. There's more, more resistance. Uh, there's more obstacles that they got to deal with before they can get to where they're trying to get in this great work, in this great ministry of the Lord. And the disciples still are oblivious to really what's taking place. And they don't really understand what it is that they're facing and what they're up against. And I don't have time to go through all those. I just want to end with just one verse. And uh, jump over to John chapter 12. I'm, I'm out of time already, but I'm, I'm going to end with this one verse, and we'll wrap this up uh, at, at some other time. In John chapter 12, Jesus now is, once again, he's going to foretell of his death. And in John chapter 12, verse 27, he says, Now my soul has become troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify thy name was his prayer. Father, glorify thy name, verse 28. And there came therefore a voice out of heaven saying, I both glorified it and I will glorify it again. So Jesus predicts that he's going to die, but it means he'll be glorified. He then makes a promise in verse 26 that if any man will serve him, him will his father honor and they will be with him also. He then prays and asks the Father to glorify his name. And the Father says, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. So in his death, the Father assures Jesus that he's with him. As he faces death, the Father affirms, you're my son at his baptism. You're my son on the Mount of Transfiguration. You're my son just before you die. And that's what God will be for you is what I'm trying to tell you. When you totally submit yourself to him, he will be there for you to affirm he's pleased with you and he's satisfied with you. When you stand in the baptismal waters, he will transform you on the mountain to encourage you that you have the power and the grace that you need to discharge his will. And when you come to the valley of the shadow of death, he will say, I will glorify myself in you and I will glorify myself again. And even in your death, I will be glorified. Well, I've served this with you before and I close with this to the young people. I know we'll forget. The last word that my father said to me from his deathbed. To this day, and they always be great words of, of encouragement to me. After a very strained relationship, all through my childhood into adulthood, we became good friends those years of his illness and sickness. And I never forget. I would have never thought this was on his mind. And it, it, it totally, still to this day, I'm amazed on life support system, lungs totally eaten up by black lung and silicosis, barely able to speak. He asked me to bend down over him and I put my ear to his lips and he whispered in my ear, I love you all. And then to my amazement, he said, don't forget me. Don't forget me. As he was ready to go into eternity, he wanted his children to remember. And that was amazing to me. Of all the things that he could have said, don't forget me. Don't forget me. Well, God is our Father. And God doesn't want us to forget him. And that's why when you remember the Bible, the Bible says, the Lord says, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, remember the Creator in the days of your youth. Don't forget your God when you come into your prosperity. He tells the children of Israel before they go into the promised land, God wants us to remember him. And how we live reflects whether or not we are truly remembering him or whether our lips are merely mimicking and mouthing that we remember him. Let's pray together, shall we? I'm through. I thank you for your time. I'm out of mind. Father, we thank you that you've affirmed your love for the Lord.